doing it. Um, tell us the story behind the collaboration of you and John Sir and how your signature model came mm -hmm. together. There isn't a great deal to tell really. Um, the only useful stuff I can tell anyone watching this is that I, I first met a Sir guitar by accident at a trade show many years ago and it turned out that I loved what Sir did and they seemed to like what I do as well. So. The, the partnership almost made itself happen and it's been very fruitful because I've learned a lot from John and those guys about how different woods help to contribute to the tone of an instrument and I became a more informed guitar buyer if you like and all I could really offer them in return was a bit of feedback about how the guitars were working out for me as a gigging musician and what the strong points and weak points were for every pickup and every wood combination but it was great because then when we I think it was all leading towards this inevitable thing where we'd talk about a signature model one day. And when we did, I felt a little bit more informed and qualified to describe what I wanted in more detail because I'd learned all this stuff from the Sir guys. I tried out a lot of their instruments over the past few years. And it just works. And what was your mindset? What did you want in a guitar when you started talking about the signature model? What type of sound were you going for? Um, well, I've always been a mahogany fan. Uh, this is ironic because my c the current signature model that I've been playing with the Aristocrat stuff is the opposite. It's basswood and it's a maple neck and it's anti-mahogany. But mahogany has this kind of honky mid-range EQ. And to me, that's what an electric guitar should sound like. The guitar I hear in my head sounds like that. I guess because when I grew up, I was listening to obscure players or partially obscure players like Sal Clemenson from the Alex Harvey band. And he was an SG guy. So that Gibson SG tonality just sounds right to me it's in my DNA now so I wanted to start with that blueprint of a mahogany sounding guitar acoustically and then see what kind of wiring tricks we could apply to make it do all the other sounds I might want so the dream foolishly of course the dream was let's build one guitar that can do everything and you can never do that you can never make a Strat sound exactly like a Les Paul and vice versa but that was the plan start with mahogany see how versatile we can make it, see how playable we can make it. And there were a couple of little tweaks, like the tremel no for locking the bridge, so I can go on the plane just with one guitar. Yeah. And when it's time for the drop D song, it doesn't take 20 minutes to retune with my floating tram. Yeah. Or the blower switch, which bypasses oh. the volume and the tone, and all, you know, <laughs> I won't bore you with that stuff. Um. But yeah, it was meant to be all things to all men. And then, yeah. obviously, we came up with different flavors of that. There's a set neck one, there's the bolt on pretty one. And the one I'm using the most now is like the, the beaten up looking one. Yeah, the antique. Which I one, think yeah. still has that mahogany frequency, but it's got more underneath it and more above it as well. Yeah. So it, it listens to every frequency and then you use the amp to pick out the stuff you really want to hear. Okay. Um, looking back on your career, um, what are the few most memorable moments you can think of right now? Um, Okay, just off the top of my head, being on national TV when I was nine was cool because then when I went to school the next day, yeah, I didn't know anyone right. else who had been on TV. So that was kind of fun. Yeah, I played some Hendrix song and maybe a Chuck Berry song. I'm sure it sucked, <laughs> but we were small, so it's okay to suck when you're that size. Um, what else? Um, I have to say, playing Glastonbury Festival with Dizzy Rascal who's a big, big rapper in the UK, and I found myself playing in his band. That was good. I played Glastonbury before in small dance tents, playing weird electronic music, and everyone was unhappy and covered in mud, and there were 12 people in the audience, and it was all very disappointing. And then two years later, I went back with Dizzy, and there were more than 100,000 people in the crowd, and they all know the words, and they're all jumping up and down, and it was intense. It's like, cool, I've spent my life playing weird fusion music and this is what it feels like to play music that normal people like. Look at them, there's millions of them. And I, I wish I could share that feeling with everyone who plays an instrument because it's, it's great just to play simple stuff and really feel like you're helping to yeah. get that energy out of people. Uh, Phil made me ask this question, it's not in the interview. Uh, the first Erotic Cakes gig, did something happen there? I don't even remember. Okay. Probably. Phil does. <laughs> okay. okay. So we'll ask him later. Yeah. Um, oh, I fully intend to. <laughs> when this runs out, I'm going back to the source of this. And, uh, <laughs> uh, grill, Phil. Uh, do you recall 
recall any hard or painful decisions that you had to make in your career? Um, probably. Um, I choose not to think about them. I think hindsight may well be twenty twenty, but yeah. it's not always that useful. Um, whatever I've done over the years, I did what felt best at the time. And I guess I've, I've learned from the results of every decision I've made. But there's nothing I would really change. So it's not so much whether you make the right decision or the wrong decision, it's more about whether you learn from it in the right way, having made it. Um, the, probably the most difficult thing I ever had to do was deciding to play music for a living at a time when I was at Oxford University reading English and my grandparents were very proud of me and all that. I was quite good at English a lot of these ago. <laughs> and uh, it, it reached a point where people like Mike Varney from Shrapnel Records were phoning to say, I really like your demo, maybe we could do an album one day. And on the other hand, there are these people saying, I really like this essay you wrote about Anglo-Saxon literature or whatever. And it's like, I can't be pulled both ways. I have to do something dramatic and kind of sever one of these ties to force myself to go the other way. So just deciding to take music, which I'd always done just for fun, and turn it into the thing that I would, I would do to generate rent money and pay for my existence for the rest of my life. That felt tough. It felt like maybe I'm screwing up horribly here. But it also felt like I have to do something. I have to go one way or the other. Otherwise, you're kind of giving 50% of your soul to each of these yeah. two things, and what's the point? Yeah, it's interesting, really. I, uh, I read about the studying at Oxford, and when I wrote this question, I had this in mind. Right. I didn't, didn't want to. Okay. Words. Well. Um, the Aristocrats, Brian Beller, Marco Miniman and yourself yeah. have just released an album a few months ago. It's true. And uh, what's the story behind the band? Uh, what are you up to? What are the plans? No, the okay. Are. The story behind the band is uh, Brian had a gig booked, like a 30-minute slot at this big event called the Bass Bash, which happens in Anaheim every January to coincide with the NAMM show. And all these bass players turn up and do their thing. And Brian, Brian's plan for his slot was to have Marco on drums and Greg Howe on guitar. And I wish I'd seen that gig. That would have been awesome. But it never happened. Uh, Greg had to cancel at the last minute. So Brian was kind of panicking. He's like, who can I get? Uh, someone recommended me. He emailed me and said, uh, do you want to stand in? And it would help me out a lot. So obviously I agreed to do the gig. And we picked two songs from each, of each member's back catalogue. Uh, learned them really suddenly, went there, did the gig, and I guess two things happened. The audience responded with so much enthusiasm, but none of us were prepared for it. And or, more importantly than that even, we all just felt this connection on stage. It's like we've practically come on stage unrehearsed. We had one very brief rehearsal. And yet it felt like we've been playing together for a long time and that we all shared certain things, like a sense of humour. Yeah. I think that's the, probably the best way I can sum it up. We all have this, the same balance between how important it is to play things properly and take it seriously, but also how important it is to be naughty. So we came off stage and we were all a bit pumped and pretty much all at the same time we looked at each other and said, we've got to do more of this. It was almost inglorious stereo, <laughs> all wet, dry, wet, you know, three voices all saying the same thing. So. Obviously it's tough, we've got two guys in different parts of the US and there's me in the UK, so how are we going to make this work? So we just set a deadline for ourselves, we booked a studio in Chicago for about five days and agreed to write three songs each, email each other the MP3s, learn them and then just arrange it and learn it all and record it properly in the studio. So we did that and magically an album popped up. And yeah, we're, we're having a lot of fun. We've done quite a lot of gigs already. We've done some Japan and Korea. We've done the East Coast of the States and Canada. We had, did a little bit in the LA area and lots of plans for next year. Like more Californian stuff, lots of European stuff. And we're going to some unusual places like Israel and Turkey, places that we wouldn't normally go. So it's just rolling along nicely now. Uh, what advice do you have for young aspiring guitarists or musicians in general, uh, both from a musician's and a teacher's standpoint? I'm not sure. I think the thing to bear in mind is I play music because I can't help it. I was so young when I started playing. For me, I didn't even decide to play guitar. 
just one of those things in the same way that you don't decide to learn to walk or to learn to speak Croatian or whatever. You just find one day, oh, I can do this because everyone around me is doing this. Um, so I'm aware my situation might not be the same as, say, some 13, 14 year old who wants to buy his Ibanez for the first time because he's just seen John Petrucci or Paul Gilbert or something like that. I don't know what to tell that kid because I was never that kid. Um, but I think the really important thing is if you're going to spend time with your instrument I think it's important to play with other people and to other people because music is a social activity if it ends up with you and your metronome in a darkened bedroom for kind of 12 hours a day you're going to make yourself unhappy and no one is going to care how good your, your alternate picking gets or something like that so always think about what's this music for why am I doing this how can I use these skills I'm developing to communicate with people um, okay. Uh, That's about as deep as I can get after this. <laughs> uh, what are your own plans for the near future? Uh, what can the mm. Godfrey Govan fans expect? Um, I wish I knew. Part of my policy in musical life is to remain open to any opportunity that might present itself. Well, lots of weird stuff happens all the time, but I mean, I try to stay tuned in to the fact that some of that weird stuff might be an opportunity worth pursuing like the aristocrats thing it just kind of happened I couldn't have predicted that I never signed up for that I signed up to do one 30 minute gig and then it kind of roller coasted along just because it felt right so I guess I'll carry on applying that policy just do whatever feels good I mean I have to do another solo album at some point but my official line, so I never have to be asked this question again, is I don't know when it will come out. <laughs> when it's ready, you can hear it. Okay. Don't rush me. Okay. But, well, uh, it's been nice talking to you. Thank you. Nice, nice one. You it's been a pleasure. It's nice to be here. Done.